Good morning and welcome to Casino Baptist Church. My name is Pastor Stephen Gort and I want to thank you for joining with me today. Today, uh, if it's your first time, a special welcome. We are going to kick off a new series today. Being the first Sunday in February for 2024, we will be starting a series on John's Gospel. And that'll run for you know, maybe up to halfway through the year. Also being the first Sunday of the month, if, particularly if you're a regular, you would know that we often celebrate communion together. And we will do that today at the end of this message. So if you'd like to grab a piece of bread or a cracker or something that you can eat that represents the bread, the body of Jesus, please uh, get that now or organize to get it a little bit later. And also something to drink that reminds us of the blood that was shed for us. As we gather, let me open in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you that we can come and worship you like this together. Help us to learn from your word. And we pray for this in your name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, please open or look it up later if you'd like to John chapter 1. And we're going to focus uh, in particular today on the first 12 verses. So that is John chapter 1. And as we begin, I wonder, are any of you afraid of the dark? Now, we often might think about that question to children, but even as adults, am I, are you afraid of the dark? Do you ever think that you could live life normally if you never saw the sun or had light again? Could you do that? Are you afraid of the dark? Could you live in the dark? And I want us to start to think about that today because we get this light dark motif as we look at John chapter 1. And as I think about it, I would say that in general, I'm not afraid of the dark. Now, have you ever been to a place, maybe it's in the country, uh, no street lights, no house lights are on, and you or in a cave or something like that, and you feel that it is so dark that you can almost touch the darkness, that it feels solid. You ever been in that situation? Well, many of us probably haven't. It could start to, we would say we're not afraid of the dark, but it does give us a little wind wings, doesn't it? We just feel a little bit odd about that. It is so dark you could almost touch it. Well, I think we could see it in other ways too. I know uh, out where I live at North Casino, uh, if I don't have, uh, there are no street lights, uh, if I don't have any lights on in the house, then when we're outside, it can get really, really dark. And often at night, it can be quiet too. But then occasionally, you could be out at certain times of the year, you'll hear the flap, 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 flap. And bat wings, because we have bats around our area. And at times, even though I'm not afraid of the dark, sometimes that gets you a little anxious. Or maybe, You've gone into a cave system. I think one of the last caves I did was a number of years ago. It was down at Wellington, the Wellington Caves. And they get you to a certain part. They turn off all the lights. And then they get you to try to move around. I can tell you, maybe not afraid of the dark. But in that situation, yeah, you, you get a little anxious. What about you? Are you afraid of the dark? Or are there times, like I've already given examples of, that you feel a little anxious in the dark. Because I think we are made, as, as humans, as people, we are made for the light. Now our scientists will tell us that we need a little bit of daylight uh, each day. You've got to get the right amount of vitamins and you get that from the sun. Now, you've got to be careful of that because too much sun and yes, you get a face that looks like mine you end up with skin cancers and other things. So you've got to balance that. But light is good. Now, there are some people in the world, uh, in certain countries, that have very minimal light in the year. And they really struggle and they have, to, they, they have poor health because of that. We need light. 
doctors, scientists, they tell us we need light in our lives to function as proper human beings. But do you realize it's nothing new? Yeah, God in his word, and if you know chapter 1 of John, or have already read through it, and not just John, but in other parts of scripture, God has talked about that we need to be people of the light. That we don't want to live in darkness anymore. Same as what the doctors say. But not talking about physical light and physical health. When God talks about light and darkness, he's talking about spiritual light and darkness and spiritual health. So today, that's what we want to look at as we come to look at John chapter 1. Now, we are beginning a new series. And if you've been with me for any length of time over the last couple of years, you would know when we begin a new series, we ask a bunch of questions, don't we? And I think to help us understand the book, these questions are really good to ask. We get in and look at the background of the letter. So one of the first obvious questions is, who wrote it? Who wrote John's Gospel? Well, the answer in this case is fairly simple. It is John. Jesus actually calls this guy his beloved disciple. That is the John that we're talking about. When was it written? Well, what we could tell from what is written here and from history, it was written around 90 AD. So almost at the end of the first century. John's gospel is, as I just said, a gospel. It is one of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It is one of the records of Jesus' life and what he talked about and what he did. But it is different. It is different to Matthew, Mark, and Luke because it is not a biography of Jesus' life. It's not a chronological order. Born, lived, died. That's not how John does it. It is something that is different. So to help us understand why it's different, I think we need to reflect on why he wrote it. So why did he write it? Well, if we're thinking about the uh, about 90 AD, we know from history and other sources that the Jewish people were scattered. They were scattered throughout the known world and they were really struggling at this time. Because you remember what happened in 70 AD, 20 years earlier? The Romans destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. So for the Jewish people that thought the only place to worship God was the temple, now they couldn't do that, they were really struggling. They were thinking, how can we worship God now scattered throughout the world? And what they tried to do was to hold on to all the religious festivals that uh we read about particularly in the Old Testament. And they thought if they could hold on to those festivals and just go through the practice of those festivals, then they were okay with God. Well, John's Gospel has something else to say. If we look at chapters 1 to 12, you could sort of call this part of John's Gospel the Book of Signs. Because in it, John records that Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of all those religious festivals. So the Jews, remember, no temple, don't know how to worship God, but desperately hanging on to the festivals. And they're living after the time of Jesus. So John says, well, those festivals you try to hold on to, guess what? Jesus, God's son, the Messiah, he is the fulfillment of all of them. And that's what we get. That's why I think this is in chapters 1 to 12. It's the book of signs. It's the part of John's gospel where we get those famous, the seven I am statements. Remember, I am the bread of life and the other ones as well. That's where these come. And then you move on to the second half of the book, chapters 13 through to 21. And I think you could call that the book of glory. It's where John records Jesus' death and what it all means about what he, why he did it. So why did he write it? Well, if you just think about what I said, the Jewish people pursuing festivals, John saying, hey, great that you are, 
But I can tell you who's better. Jesus. He completes and he fulfills. He perfects all of them. And then he goes on and says, and the most important part is his death. And this is what it means. Can you sort of see why he wrote it? More than that, though. What I love about John is he actually spells it out. He says this to us in John chapter 20, verse 31. And I think this is the theme verse for the whole uh, book of John. And it's our theme verse for the series. Okay? But these are written, talking about the book, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's why John wrote it. John wrote it so that you may believe and understand who Jesus is. Because remember, uh, the Jews that he wrote to, or the Gentiles that were hearing this as well, they did not live at the time of Jesus. Or they may have um, and just been very young then. But now John is saying, you know, those things that you're trying to hold on to, the festivals and other things, he's Jesus. And he is better than all of them. He is the one who's the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And if you believe in him, you can have life in his name. That's why this book was written. That's partly why I called this series, Believing Gives Life. Right from the beginning of this series. Do you know Jesus? Do you know him as uh, it says here in chapter 20, verse 31, that he's the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name. Do you have life today? Because you believe in Jesus. This is what we want to look at when we come to this series. This was written to Jews predominantly, but also to Gentiles. And it was written at a time where they needed to hear about Jesus. It's no different today, is it? Now this is a letter, a book that is written to us so that we may hear about him, we may believe, and then we may live as his disciples. And the first step in this series, the first step to understand, is this whole thing about light and darkness. Now the Bible, as I said right back at the beginning, often talks about darkness, and it uses it as a metaphor to talk about the brokenness of our world, to talk about the sin in our world, and it's all described as darkness. In verse 4 and 5 of chapter 1, we read this. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The world we live in is described as darkness. And I want to ask the question I asked right back at the beginning. Who, or are you, afraid? Of the dark. Now you can sort of start to see after reading that verse where I might be coming from. Because the answer is we should all be. Because we don't want to live in the darkness. We want to be people of the light. We want to live in the light. We don't want to be living and be a part of this broken, sinful world. We want to leave that behind. Still live here physically. But we want to live in the light. We want to believe and have faith in Jesus. We want to live his way and look forward to eternal life. That, in a short, is living in the light. Now, if you have a dark room and you walk in and turn the light on, what happens? What happens to the darkness? Now, the moment you flick the light on, the darkness is gone, isn't it? Now, lightness and dark cannot coexist. And that's why we should be afraid of the dark. Because if Jesus is the light, and living with him for eternity is living in the light, and this world is dark, then we can't live here and focus on the world and be in the world, celebrate and live the sinfulness of the world, and then expect to be in eternity with Jesus in the light. They don't go together. 
And that is why we need to understand what it is to follow the light. And this, these verses tell us that in chapter 1 it describes Jesus as the Word, that he is there at creation, that God himself is the light, and it shatters the dark. Now, many of you would know Robert Louis Stevenson, and he was an author. And when he was a child, he was quite sick. But he records this uh, in the mid-19th century, around 1850s. He saw, uh, he was sitting by his bedside because he was sick. He was looking out the window. And there was a man there at night who was called a lamplighter. He'd go along and light the street lamps. Now, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson was so caught up in watching that. He didn't hear his nurse enter the room, and the nurse asked him what he was looking at. And he made this reply. I'm watching a man make holes in the darkness. I'm watching a man make holes in the darkness. And in a way, that is what John chapter 1 is saying. That Jesus is making holes in the darkness. Holes, remember, not physically, but spiritually. That his light, he is bringing spiritual help, spiritual light into our world, spiritually dark, and Jesus pokes holes in it. He brings light into the darkness. Verse 5 again, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This verse was so true for Jesus' day. Because remember, he was put to death. Jews and Gentiles, they saw his miracles, they heard his teaching, but most of them just shouted for his death. He was put to death. It looked like the darkness had won. But then three days later, what did God do? Brought his son back to life again, showing that Jesus had defeated death, that he had defeated sin, that Jesus, the light, had poked holes in the darkness. When John wrote this gospel, the Jewish people were spread throughout the known world, intermixed with Gentiles, trying to hold on to their festi religious festivals, their religious rituals. They thought at that time Jesus was dead and buried, and they didn't believe that he was resurrected. They thought darkness had won. The Gentiles also, you know, they chased their money, they chased their good times. They lived for themselves. They lived for this life. Not much different to today, really. They had no thought about Jesus at all. That he was dead, that he was buried, even if they acknowledged him at all. That darkness... But John, in his opening chapter, says, no, darkness did not win. Jesus himself is still the one who pokes holes in the darkness. He brings light. Let's just think for a moment. Why do we have light? And don't we have light to lighten, to illuminate? We have light to give direction. And when you sometimes can uh, bring light to dark places, it gives or provides hope. And that's what Jesus does, doesn't he? I mean, how, but how do we know this? How do we know that by his light, he illuminates the sin in our lives? That he illuminates how we should live for him? How he gives direction and helps us to make choices in life that go along with what God wants? And how do we get that hope? How do we know these things? Well, it's by reading his word. It's through prayer. And remember, that was in our theme verse, John 20, verse 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. We read it in his word. We read it in John's gospel. John's gospel brings light. It tells us about Jesus. It illuminates our lives. It illuminates the sin and the brokenness and the darkness in our world. And it illuminates how Jesus has overcome that. It gives direction. It gives hope. 
And so today, as we begin this series, my prayer is that you may believe. My prayer is that all people will come to that point of seeing the light in the darkness and believe and have life. That we may live with God forever. That we may look to have eternal life because we understand and love and follow the light. Now back in chapter 1 verse 12 it says this, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Believing in Jesus, following the light, allows us to become children of God. And it is the only way that we can be with God forever. So, as we begin a new year, some of you might have you know, given you New Year's resolutions. These are the changes. This is what you're going to do this year. How have you gone in keeping them? Well, can I encourage you, can I give you hope that maybe if this is the first time you're watching and you don't know Jesus, as we go through this series, really hear his words and look at his life and look how he brings light into the darkness so that, as our theme verse said, you may have a chance to respond. This is a New Year's resolution that I think we should all look forward to. And for those of us who may have already made this choice, encourage us to continue to see that we need to learn about the light and how it has changed the world. That's what we're going to look at, particularly as we look at in the first 12 chapters of John and the Book of Science. I want you to notice verse 6 through to 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, the guy who wrote the book. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now these verses are talking and saying that John came he wasn't Jesus. He wasn't the light, but he came people he came to point people to the light. He came to point people towards Jesus. But you notice what's significant here? Verse 8. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. He godly man, yes, but a witness. And I think there's a twofold challenge here. For those of us who say already, and maybe this includes you, that you already know Jesus, you already are in the light and follow the light. I think there are two challenges. One, he says here, he was not the light. He needed to walk in the light. He was a godly man who actually went to the island of Patmos. And when we looked at the book of Revelation, we saw what happened to him there. He was a man who suffered greatly because he lived in the light. He needed to understand it. He needed to learn more about it so that he could walk the way God wanted. I think one of the challenges is, do we read God's word enough so that God can show us the light, illuminate his word, so that we can see the sin in our life and say, no, learn from God's word so we know how he wants us to live. Secondly, I think, the challenge here is that he was a witness. Now, if you know, uh, recently over summer, we've had quite a few blackouts at our place and have to uh, pull out candles. And from one candle, once it is lit, I can go around and light a whole bunch of others. And in the same way here, I think being a witness, John has is walking in the light. He has seen the light. He has responded to the light and he himself now is like that little candle going around and lighting other lights in helping point people to Jesus. He is witnessing. We are reading his witness in a way he is the gospel. He is evangelizing us so that we may believe. 
to the Jewish people. Hey, you're trying to hold on to your rituals and religious festivals. Well, let me tell you, Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, he actually fulfills all of them. So now that you understand that, he says to the Jews, will you respond and follow the light? Will you step into the light? And to the Gentiles who may know nothing about Jesus, know nothing about the religious festivals. He's going to tell them that he is the light and this is how he lived and this is why he did what he did. And this is why he died for you. So respond and walk in the light. He is the witness. You know, sometimes I think when you, one way to think about the light into the darkness and being the witness and shining the light the candles idea works well, but also I think the sun and the moon. See, the moon has no light of its own. It only reflects the light of the sun. And it reflects the sun's most brightly when it is the darkest of nights. When we think about that, I think that picture is very clear of what we get here with Jesus. We are to be his mirrors. We are the moon. He is the sun. We see his light and then we shine it, reflect it out into the darkness of our world. And as it was described here in John chapter 1, our world is dark. It is sinful. It is broken. Our world needs light. Our world needs others, not just Jesus, to poke holes into the light. And that's where we come in. If we understand, read, and know God's word, and then live the life that God wants, we can help poke holes in the darkness and reflect God's light to the world. In John's time, people needed to hear about the light. Jesus came to provide light so that people would believe. Now, many people, I think, have heard about Jesus. In a way, you could say they have seen Jesus or they think they have. But seeing is not always believing. And that's why I've called this sermon today, Seeing is Not Always Believing. But truly coming to see the light. That, if we believe in Jesus and what he's done, that gives us life for eternity. And that's my prayer. That's my prayer for you today and for me. That as we go through this series, we will learn about Jesus, see the light in the darkness, and that God's Spirit may bring us to a point where we believe and to give us the courage to be able to share that light into our dark worlds. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the light. Thank you for what Jesus did at the cross. Lord, as we come to a time in a moment of communion, where we remember that in the symbols of the bread and the grape juice, we just offer it all up to you and say thank you. May we reflect your light into our world this week. Through your spirit, help us to do that, we pray, today and this week, in your name. Amen. Well, if you'd like to go grab uh, something that you can eat or something to drink, something that can be symbols of what Jesus has done. I'm going to share with you as I gather my Bible. Uh, just a couple of verses from another gospel, from Luke's gospel. And Luke goes on the night before Jesus died, and he says this. And he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to them and said, This is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. So if you have a piece of bread or a cracker or something like that, this is not the actual body of Jesus. He doesn't miraculously or magically or spiritually become that. It is a symbol. 
It is a symbol that just as Jesus said, the night before he died, in a few hours, his body would be broken for not just his disciples, but for all humanity. Darkness thought it was about to win. Satan thought he was about to win with Jesus' death. His broken body, the death, what we remember is Good Friday. It's not the end of the story. So as we think about it, let us eat together and remember that light came into our world. Let us eat. Luke then goes on and records what Jesus said. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. You've got something there to drink. The redness that we often use, with it, whether it's either wine or grape juice or whatever you might have, it is done so that it reminds us of blood. It's the symbol of blood. The symbol that we, in the Old Testament, a blood sacrifice was required for forgiveness of sin. And for light to come into the darkness, forgiveness had to be given for sin. And Jesus does it when he dies, through his broken body and his shed blood. It meets all the requirements that, the, that God in the Old Testament required. But again, his death, his burial was not the end of the story. Three days later, Jesus showed that you can believe in Jesus. You can believe in his miracles. You can believe in what he said. You can believe when he says he is the light. Why? Because here he is alive again. And would you want to follow a leader who said, yes, there's life after death, and then died and nothing, and stayed dead? Probably not. But it reinforces that God always keeps his promises, that everything God says he does, and Jesus was brought back to life again. The light conquers the darkness. He conquered the sin. He defeated Satan. And we can celebrate that and be thankful for it and know that if you today say that you love and follow him, you'll be with him for eternity. What a thing to remember. So let's do that now as we drink together. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. Your son dying on the cross and then being raised to life again three days later. That's life. That's light. That's love. Thank you, Lord. Lord, help me to be the child, as we looked at in chapter 1, verse 12, the child of you that you want me to be, that I may live that life that reflects your love and light to others in our world. Lord, help us not to take communion that we celebrate now, this Lord's Supper for granted, but to go out and respond to it. Help us to do that today, I pray, in your name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining with me today. And my prayer is that you may read ahead through John's Gospel and then get excited about things that we're going to look at week by week as we open his word together. May God bless you and your family this week, and I'll look forward to catching up with you next week. God bless.